the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's what we recognize and celebrate today. Um, it brings it brings us hope and it brings us victory and it brings us life. We, I, I was watching, um, I, I, you guys know I watch a lot of news, maybe too much, but uh, they were talking about Easter and they were talking about, I should say they were talking about Jesus and the sacrifice of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus and they were focusing all that and then they said and yet it seems pretty straightforward and it seems pretty simple and it seems easy to grab a hold of and yet and yet people have found a way to kind of mess with it and then they bring up a picture of an Easter bunny uh, and then they says and I don't know about you guys and they went around asking that do bunnies have eggs or do they you know do eggs and 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 it's just it's just it's just interesting, I guess I should say, that, that such a glorious celebration, such an amazing thing that happened a few thousand years ago, and to distort from that or to, to suggest anything other than that is just, you know, I, I don't know about you guys, my family and my family, our birthdays are special. Okay, and whosever birthday it is, they get to call, this is what we're going to eat, uh, and they choose the dinner, and, and they choose a lot of different things, and, and uh, to interfere with that is funny, because if you start messing with somebody's birthday, they always call me, hey, hey, it's my birthday, all right, so let's focus on me, and, and uh, what we're celebrating today is the remembrance and the celebration of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the grave. Um, we were here um, on Friday and we celebrated Good Friday service, which, which was the amazing time when Jesus, when Jesus showed the world, us, those before us, those that will follow us, Jesus showed us his amazing love by laying down his life to die for our sins. All of my faults, all of the evil, all of the wrong, all of the things that I have done that I I owe God for the things that I've done against God. I owe God so much because of my failures to God. A, a righteous and a pure God. Jesus said, I'll take all of your failures, all of your sins, all of your wrongs, and I'll pay the price. And the price was death. Jesus said, in the, I mean, God said in the, in the very beginning to Adam and Eve, the day that you eat of this fruit that I told you not to eat of, you shall surely die. So when they ate of it, that introduced death. So the penalty for all of my sins and my failures to God was death. And, and Jesus didn't just simply say, I'll take the chastening for you, I'll take the whipping for you, I'll take the suffering for you. Jesus said, I will die for you. And that's, a, that's just amazing love that someone, because I know me, okay? I, I, you know, I don't even know if I would die for me, let alone Jesus said, I will, and he laid down his life. Jesus tells us in John 15, 13, he says, greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. Think about that. Jesus looks at us and says, we're, we are his friends. He loves us. And the mind-blowing thing is that he did this when we were still in sin, when we didn't believe in him, when we didn't follow, follow him, when, even when some people hated him. Those that hated Jesus, those that were at, the, at the, the, the cross and mocking him, and those previous who said, what should we do? When Pilate said, what should I do with him? And they said, crucify him. Those people who shouted that, and those people at the cross mocking him, Jesus considered his friends, and he says, I'm, I'm dying for you. Even in that condition. We read in Romans 5, Verses 6 to 8, it says, For when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. Not the godly, for the ungodly. He says, For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, 
Christ died for us. That's an amazing thing to grab a hold of. So this is what happened, or that's what happened on Friday, and that's what we spoke about at our Good Friday service. After Jesus died, a man by the name of Joseph asked Pilate for the body of Jesus to remove from the, from the cross. And we read in Matthew 27, verses 59 to 60, he says, when, when Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in, the, in his new tomb, which he had hewn out of a rock, and he rolled a large stone against the door of the tomb, and he departed. Everyone, after that stone was rolled, a few... A few of you guys, a few of the ladies followed to where they were burying Jesus because Jesus died uh, on a Friday and Friday evening uh, when the sunset would have began the Sabbath and they're not allowed to do anything on the Sabbath so they couldn't fully prepare Jesus' body for the burial. So the ladies' intentions was to come back after the Sabbath which would have been Sunday morning and they would have, were going to finish the burial of Jesus and the preparations of Jesus. Okay, and so when they took him down, the ladies followed, but after the crucifixion and after the ladies saw the stone roll, rolled in front, everybody went home. I mean, that's it. All of their discouragement and feeling completely hopeless was like, man, in fact, there were a, a couple of disciples that were on their way to Emmaus, and when Jesus met up with them, they said that, but we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. We had all of our hopes, all of our trust. It was like, he's it. He's the Messiah we've been waiting for. But they crucified him. They put him in a grave, and they rolled a big stone in front of him, so our hope's gone. What we were anticipating is, is no longer accessible, no longer possible. Their hope was absolutely and completely gone. And, and these, these two men on the road to Emmaus, they were talking about Jesus. They were talking about how glorious it was to be around him and to see and to know the things that he had done. But it's gone, finished. Done. There's no hope any longer. But what they didn't realize was that this was not the end. There was more coming. Jesus had risen from the grave. Jesus had conquered death. Nobody has ever conquered death before Jesus. There have been a lot of people... Houdini said that he was going to conquer death. And he, you know, if I can get out of handcuffs, I can get out of death. Nobody's seen him since he's died, so that means he didn't get out of it. A lot of people have decided, well, you know what, I'm going to freeze my body, and, and then they're going to bring me back. They're either still frozen or somebody thawed them and buried them. I don't know. But there was one man who three days after he had he had been crucified, rose from the grave, conquering death. That was, that was the purpose of the resurrection, you guys, to conquer and to defeat death. And God had already said that I will conquer death. We read in Hosea 13, 14, God says, I will ransom them from the power of the grave. I will redeem them from death. The grave, from death. Redeem means to buy back something at full price. What was the price of sin? It was death. Jesus paid the full price and therefore redeemed us. You could redeem land back in the days in the Old Testament to where if, if I was having a financial problem and, and I didn't have the money and I owed money, then I could sell myself, if you were, as a slave for so many years to pay off my land and and if I at the end of the time if I didn't have the money to buy the land a family member of mine could come and pay what was owed and redeem that land for the family Jesus has redeemed us he has redeemed us from death there's nothing I can do about death there's nothing you can do about death but Jesus paid the full price and redeemed us from death 
Jesus has fulfilled that promise in Hosea of, of God. He has risen from the grave, conquering death and the grave. Romans 6, 9 says that death no longer has dominion over Jesus. He will never die again. Death has no hand control threat on Jesus. That's amazing. A lot of people who have had experiences in life and they say that I died and, and then I came back. But they're going to die again, okay? Whoever has died and come back, uh, you know, um, they can celebrate for a while and hallelujah that they got, they, God did give them more life, but they will die again. Jesus, not so. Death no longer has dominion over Jesus. Now, I'm sharing this with you because I need you to know the power of God. Okay, you need to know the absolute power of God. He is above all. All. Everything. He is greater than any other power. And we live in a day and age to where power is scary. Okay, when you see the, uh, the abilities of the atomic bomb, and now they've got bombs that, you know, you can bomb cities and the buildings stay, but the people die. And, and you see all this power, and it's like, wow, nothing at all compared to the power of God. He is above all. He is greater than any other power. He is also greater than any of our failures and our sins. And, and I don't know about you, but I know I've got some pretty horrific sins and failures in my life. But he's more powerful than my failures. His love and his power is over everything. Listen, folks, after Jesus died and was buried, everyone was discouraged. Everyone felt completely hopeless. And this is something that, especially I believe in our day and age, we're, we're seeing this hopelessness. We're seeing this, what's the point? What's the reason? I mean, it's all going to fade away. We're, you know, they're all going to take over. They're all going to nuke us. Or, you know, the, the, the earth is supposed to, what do we got? How many years do we have left now? I forget. Uh, five, six years, seven years before the earth is supposed to be gone because of, well, we can't call it climate change no more anyways. <laughs> I mean, there's, there's no hope that is given to anybody. It's just, yeah, you know what? Things are really tore up, messed up, brutal, mean, vicious, evil. And, and this is where they felt. It's like, man, I, I thought Jesus was the answer, but now he's gone. And, and this is where we can find ourselves sometimes feeling like, you know what, it, this happened to me or, or this is, 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 is now wrong with me or, or this has now come upon me or this is now what I'm facing or this is where our world is or this is where my job is or this is where my bank account is and we can have all of these things that come against us and we can just feel so hopeless. We, we can feel lost and alone. We can feel everything's caving in on us. I'm scared and I'm confused and I, I just feel hopeless. I mean, what's the point? This is what evil and sin does to us. It, it brings this hopelessness, if you will. Sin and, and, and evil, they seem, they appear to have power and victory over us. Evil and, 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 and sin seem to have victory over Jesus. They beat Jesus. They put him on a cross and then they put him in a tomb. And, and that's exactly what, what sin and, and the world does to us. It, it beats us down. It, it crucifies us in, in our purpose in life and we feel like we're stuck in a tomb. And, and we just feel so discouraged and hopeless because we don't feel there's any hope. Our, our life and our situation tells us you've, you've lost, you, you've been beaten, it's finished, you're, you're done, you've gone too far. There's no hope for you. But the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the grave 
reveals to us, oh, no, no, truth. Truth is there's hope in Christ. Amen. 1 Peter 1.3 says, Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us, has begotten you and me, again, into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. The disciples and those, because remember, Jesus had told them that he would rise on the third day, but it just, you know, it just, it didn't compute. Nobody's ever done that. And so it, though he told them, it didn't compute. That's why when we read in our, in our uh, scripture reading this morning, when, when the angel asked, what, what are you looking for the living amongst the dead for? It's like, what are you doing here? He, he told you, and he said, just as he told you, he would rise on the third day. So what are you doing here? Well, we came to finish the burial. But he told you that he would rise on the third. What day is today? It's the third day. But they, they didn't take it. They run and tell the disciples, the godly ones, the one that hung out with Jesus for three years. Yeah, they didn't believe him. Oh, uh, you know what, these ladies. In, in fact, the same guys on the road to Emmaus, after they told Jesus, when Jesus came up to them, and said, why are you guys so sad? What are you, the only one in Jerusalem doesn't know what's going on, and they told him the story, and here we thought he was the hope, and now we got these ladies running around saying he's alive. And so it was, it was looked at as a joke almost. So they had no hope. And they believed it was finished. But they didn't listen to what all God was telling them. And, and this is so important for you and I, that Satan lies to us. And he tells us that you've been defeated and that there's no hope for you. You've gone too far, done too much, haven't done enough. Whatever it takes, he lies. And he tries to rob us. And he tells us things that we're in a hopeless situation. And it's because we, we, we look at these things and we think, we think, yeah, I don't see a way out. I don't see how I can get out of this. Because we can't. But Jesus can get us out of anything. Whatever it is that has defeated us, whatever it is that has helped, left us hopeless, Jesus has defeated it. And he will lift us up out of any pit that we were in, and he will set us on the solid rock who is Jesus Christ. God tells us in Jeremiah 29, 11, I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord. Most of the time when we think God's thinking about us, that he's thinking, you crummy little, I can't believe you. But no, God says, I know what I'm thinking of you. And he says, thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. God has always tried to tell us, yeah, I know you struggle. Yeah, I know you've fallen. Yeah, I know this world is a mess. Yeah, I know that things are dangerous. Yeah, I know that it's difficult. But I have a future for you. And I'm thinking of that future for you. I'm thinking and dwelling and, and focusing on the hope that I have for you. You and I, we have a future and a hope in Jesus Christ. Psalm 130 verse 7 says, Put your hope in the Lord, for the Lord is unfailing love, and with him is full salvation. Unfailing love. How many times have we thought, you know what, I don't think God loves me because I'm really messed up. I've really given him a hard time. I've really rejected him. I've really said and done some horrible things. And the psalmist says, no, you need to put your hope in the Lord because he is unfailing love. His love never fails. And with him is full salvation. He doesn't sort of kind of save you. He fully saves us. Completely salvation, salvation in Jesus. And so, never lose hope, you guys. Never look around and think that this is the end, because it's not. The end is in the presence of the Lord. Will these physical bodies someday fade? Yes, they will. And the older I get, the more anxious I am to get into that new body. It, it's, I, 
Sometimes I'll get up from the chair in the house and Jeanette go, you okay? I'll be fine. Just give me a minute. Okay, I'm working it out. I'm moving it all. I'm all right. Almost turned into a regular thing that, you know, so do we take a couple Tylenol before we go to bed because of the aches and pains so we wake up not feeling them as much? This isn't it. There's hope. And God has promised. And, and it's almost like, it's like the angels telling the ladies, why are you here? He told you he was going to rise. It's like us. Why are we discouraged? Why, do, why are we hopeless? He told us. He told us that he has unfailing love. And then he's given us full salvation. And he's told us that we have life in Christ all eternity with, eternity with, with the Lord. Why are we hopeless? We have the hope of Christ. Accept that. Don't, don't allow yourselves to, to be the questioning ladies or the questioning disciples on the road to Emmaus or the, the doubting disciples or even Thomas who got a bad rap. You know, as far as, well, unless I can touch the holes in his hands and put my fingers, because the other, the other ten guys are going, no, 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 he was here, he was here, we saw him. Yeah, 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 I don't believe you guys. Believe, stand on the hope that we have been given through Christ. This is what Jesus' true victory does for us. It disarms the principalities and the powers of sin in the darkness that has bound people and held people down since the fall of Adam and Eve. Since the fall of Adam and Eve, the principalities and powers of sin and darkness have bound people up. But Jesus has given us victory and defeated that. He has defeated the principalities and the powers of sin and darkness. Jesus' death on the cross was for, was, pays for our sins and wipes away all of our sins and makes us clean. It, it doesn't matter how dirty you are. Okay, we, we, we take care of the, uh, the grandsons. And you guys have got to admit, I haven't brought up the boys in a, in a few Sundays. Okay, but, but it's funny. They'll come in from playing and it's like, yeah, they really need a bath tonight because they're really dirty. And then there's other times, so what do you think? Should we give them a bath? I don't know about you, but giving baths to two and three year olds, it's not that simple. Um, and then there's the cleanup because of the playing and the splashing and, and everything. And so you look at them, hey, they don't look that dirty. They'll be fine. <laughs> you, know, they, they'll, they'll be okay. you know, they didn't really play out that much today. They were mostly inside. It doesn't matter how dirty we are, it doesn't matter the depth of the sins in our lives. We've been cleansed because of the power and the victory that God had in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jesus is rising from the grave and the power and the victory gives you and I the power to live our lives here in everyday life. The same power that rose Jesus from the dead. Romans 6, 4 says, Therefore, we were buried with him, Christ, through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. The Bible tells us old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. We have a new life in Christ. Every time we've messed up and we've sinned and we've fallen short and we come to the Father and we say, I am sorry, I repent, forgive me. He says, you're forgiven. We're cleansed. Paul tells us in Philippians 3.10, he says, ah, oh, that I may know Jesus and the power of his resurrection. Paul is saying, I want to I know the power that raised Jesus from the dead. I want to know that power that ro raised him from the dead. That's the power that's been given to us. That's the victory that we have because of Jesus' victory over the grave and death. We have access to that power. Romans 8, 11 says, But if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, or who raised Christ from the dead, will also, will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. Yeah, no fears. Once we die and we enter into heaven and we're all eternity with the Lord, no more pain, sorrow, death, no, everything is going to be amazing. 
But Romans tells us in these mortal bodies, here in what we currently live in, we have the power of the resurrecting power of Jesus through the Spirit of God dwelling within us. This means that the very power that raised Jesus from the dead, giving him true victory, can come into our lives, giving us true victory over sin, making you and I alive and give us the power to live. Don't buy into the lie that you can't stop whatever it is that you're doing, that you can't change your life. The power of Jesus' resurrection can live in you if you want it to. You can have that power. I, I know it's not simple, but it's freely given, and it was demonstrated. It was demonstrated through the resurrection of Christ. All of the evil that was poured onto Christ was defeated. We have that Spirit of God dwelling within us. That's why Paul writes in Romans 6, 12, Therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its lust. And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. He says, so... Don't let it say no. Just say no to sin. And, and I know it's like, well, you know, I, I've tried. We don't always try. I, we've talked about this in other studies to where sometimes we debate it. And, and we're, you know, it's like you know, this thought comes to our head, you should do this. Oh, no, no, that's, that's sin, that's wrong, I, I shouldn't do that. And then we have a discussion, well, how sinful is it? I mean, is it like really, really bad? Or how bad do you think God will get? And we're having this discussion with it. And Romans is saying, just say no. You don't need the debate. You don't need to know, well, is it really sin? Or who says it's sin? Is it biblical sin or is it man's sin? He said, well, why are you discussing this? Well, because I want to know if I should or shouldn't, or if I can or can't. You just, he says, just say no. The thing, should I, should I say this harshly? Should I be angry? Should I give some ungodly gestures to those on the freeway that have cut me off? Why? Because they cut me off. Well, and you understand what I'm saying? It's like, he said, listen, don't go down that road. You don't have to. You have the Spirit of God enabling us to be the men and the women that God has called and enabled us to be. Jesus tells us in John 10.10, 10, he says, the thief does not come except to, to steal and to kill and to destroy. He says, I have come that you may have life and that you may have it more abundantly. So here's what Jesus has done and what he offers you and me. His death paid for your debt to God and my debt to God, which was death. He died for us. His resurrection from the, from the dead gives you and I life. And it gives you and I the power to live our life pleasing to God, which will bring us the joy and the fulfillment that we've always desired. It seems like the mindset of the world, of, of people in the world, all of us, is what's, what does it mean to have a full life? What, what do I want? What will make me happy? What will bring me joy? What will bring me fulfillment? Many people think it's, it's money. If I only had a little bit more. I mean, I, I'm not on, on, you know, in, in poverty, but I could sure use a little bit more. It would sure be easier. It would sure make me happy. It would sure make my life fuller if I just had more. And I've yet to find somebody that has ever said, multi-billionaires who have ever said, I got enough. I'm done. I'm not going to try to get no more. There's always. But we have this, if I just had some more money. If I just 
had the better job, if I just was the boss, if I just had my own company, if I just could do this, if I could only do that, if I only had this, if I only had that. We're always looking for the, full, the fullness of life. And Jesus says, listen, I came to give you life, but not just life, an abundant life, a fulfilling life. But do we trust that? Will, will I accept what he says as fulfilling me? Or will I continue to keep looking for something to fill me and satisfy me? Will I continue to look for that thing or situation or circumstance or whatever that will make me go, ah, I'm now full. Because the only fulfillment in life, to be honest with you, is Christ. He's the only one that can actually give us fulfillment, no matter what we live in, no matter what our circumstances are. It's only fulfilled through Christ. Listen, no matter what you've done, Jesus' blood cleanses you completely. Completely. Not mostly, but completely. And no matter what is trying to control your life, Jesus' resurrection power gives you hope and the abilities to overcome it in victory, which then gives us the abundant life in Christ. If you're tired of the power and the control of sin in your life, then Jesus can change your life. Jesus will, has given and offered hope Jesus will provide the victory over whatever it is. Jesus will give you the abundant life. His resurrection proves his ability and his power and his love and his grace. Jesus is our hope. God has restored us to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And just as the Spirit of God gave Jesus victory over the grave and death by raising him from the dead, so we have victory over sin through the power of Jesus' res resurrection. This then leads us to the abundant life that Jesus offers to us. This is the hope that we have. This is the purpose of the resurrection. This is what today is about. Jesus rose from the dead in victory, giving us hope and life. Don't walk away from it. Don't set it aside. Don't shelf it till next year. It's every day he gives us that fulfillment and joy. I can remember years ago I had a brother-in-law who, who had walked away from the Lord, and yet financially he was very well, well off. Uh, he was the president of a major company. And he bought a new house the same time I bought a new house. My house pretty much would have fit in his den. Um, I was excited. We were, Jeanette and I were excited with our house. Our house was a mess. It was disgusting. Our house was so dirty. You guys have all experienced moving into a house and the joy of walking in. Yeah, Jeanette broke down in tears when we walked into our house. It was that disgusting. And, and wouldn't you know it, my brother-in-law decided it would be a good day to visit me. Okay? And, and I'm thinking... Oh, man, dude, if you would have given me like two months to kind of clean it up, that would have been cool, but not the day we're moving. I mean, just moving in is a mess. But the house, I mean, before we moved in, I went over the night before and did, sprayed for bugs, so they were dead bugs everywhere. Yeah, it was bad. There were cats on the counters, uh, and the lady walking out saying, these two dogs are mine, you can have those two. Uh, <laughs> But he, he came over, but even though once Jeanette and I got over that initial shock, um, we were happy. This was, this was a four-bedroom house. Jeanette was expecting our third child. This was ideal. This was amazing. This was great. It was in the neighborhood. So we were just excited. And my brother-in-law asked me, how can you be so happy seeing what I was seeing? And, and, you know, it's almost like, now I should be happy. You saw my house, how cool and big and 
glorious and you know and then there's your house but we we had the joy why because it didn't matter I knew where this house was going Jeanette and I walked in there we, we didn't it wasn't like a beautiful home and then we got there and they destroyed it during escrow when we chose to buy the house we saw the animals we saw every window was broken, every door had holes in it. We saw the mess that it was in. The front yard had a big old U shape in it where the teenage son that lived there, they would burn out from his driveway through the front yard and out the neighbor's driveway. And so, yeah, we saw all that. But what we saw was where we could take this house. We could afford this house. Two doors down, it was a nice house. We couldn't afford, same house, but theirs was nice. So I could afford, we could afford the tore up house knowing where it was going to go. That's the hope in Christ. Y yeah, things can get tore up in our life, you guys. Yeah, things can go wrong. Yeah, burdens can be heavy, discouragements, fears. But the hope is smiling, go, but I know where Jesus can take it. Okay, I know what he can do with it. I know what he can do with this mess. I know the victories that he can give me. I have hope in that, and I know the life that I will have in Christ. That's Christianity. That's looking at it and not what I'm going through, but where I'm heading and what I have in Christ. That's the power and the victory and the hope and the life of the resurrection which we celebrate today. Father, thank you for bringing us together today. We pray, Lord, that you will anoint this day in such a special way Lord father so many of us are going through things and wrestling with things but none of this stuff down here is the end our glory is with you our hope is in you and and where you're taking us and where you're leading us our victories in Christ the life that we have isn't here in our our things our life is in Christ and so, Father, on this day of recognizing and celebrating the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus, bring that hope to heart. Lord, may we see the victories we have in Christ. May we embrace the life that Jesus died to give us. Father, bless our time as we worship you now. We do lift up our offering and ask for your blessings upon it. And we pray that you will prepare our hearts as we partake of communion, remembering that it was through the sacrifice of Jesus that gave us the hope and the victory and the life that we have. So bless this time. In Jesus' name, amen.